.exe, nc.exe, and I just look at the differences between them. I mean, that's it. If you send a good request that gives you a 200 OK, you send a bad request for a file that doesn't exist, and then it, it gives you a 404, and then all of a sudden you insert something for cross-site scripting, and it gives you a completely different error, you're up against some sort of defensive mechanism. Make sense? All right, so based on that, start playing the encoding game. So if you figure that you're up against a WAF, see if this thing handles um, hex. See if it handles UTF-7, UTF-8, UTF-16, Base-64, or mixing of them. See how it handles the multiple encodings. Most WAFs cannot handle encoding very well, okay? Especially if you start mixing the encodings together, okay? So it's a good way to try and see if you could get by the WAF. Okay, um, good buddy of mine, Sanjo Gachi and Wendell, um, they wrote a tool called WAFWOOF and I started contributing to it last year. Uh, I think it's the shit and it's in Python. So the cool thing that we're doing here is we're fingerprinting the HTTP response headers and we're identifying web application firewalls and I fucking love it. So right now we've got a pretty good list, about 10 or 12 WAFs and the list is getting bigger and bigger. The next thing that we're working on is called WAF Fun, where we're gonna work on a tool that actually brute forces web application firewall rule sets, and it's in Python. <laughs> so I'm real excited about that, guys. I really wish that we had made more progress with it, but you know, working, drinking, working and drinking, it was kinda hard to get the tool done so that I could have a working demo, but uh, hopefully you know, the next couple of conferences and next year we'll have a working demo of WAF Fun. Uh, so you can see the brute force and WAF rule sets. I think that's going to be the shit. Okay. All right. So quick thing that I use, Gary O'Leary Steele, he wrote a tool called Unicode Fun, and it's great for, um, it's Ruby, I know, but yeah. fuck Ruby. <laughs> so we're going to get that shit moved over to Python, and in my tool, it's going to be in Python. So um, we're putting that in Python, and we'll do the different encoding. We want to make a tool specifically for web application attacks that's going to be part of the WAFIT framework. WAFIT framework will include WAF Fun and uh, WAF Woof. And we'll specifically be working on multiple encodings and proxy awareness so that it can jump on Tor and it can jump on Glip proxies while it's doing all these different, different things. So that's really what we're looking for. Okay, we already talked about attacking websites through Tor. Um, I talked about this a little bit last year. Um, I don't know if anybody here works for .NET Defender or whatever fucking company makes .NET Defender. Um, we, we found that their ability to defend against SQL injection, um, how do I articulate this? Fucking sucked. <laughs> so if you throw like right here, this is a generic cross-site scripting attack. So it says script alert XSS. And the fucking thing is like, danger Will Robinson, danger you. We've run into cross-site scripting. And then it gives you this big message that says, dude, we fucking blocked you. So now, here I'm trying SQL injection with no encoding at all. And .NET Defender doesn't care. <laughs> so they block some SQL injection, specific statements like the word select. This is the height of IDS and WAF technology, right? <laughs> I'm going to block the word select. So if you encode it in Unicode, you walk right by it. So they decided to fix this last year, but they didn't fix any other encoding. So if you use any other encoding, you still walk by the thing. Does anybody work for this company? If you do, please holler at me like when, we, when I get off stage, because that, that, I don't get it, dude. Okay, and yeah, that's still me dumping the uh, admin password hash with no encoding at all against uh, .NET Defender. Sorry, dude. Fix your shit. Okay, so biggest things that I'm doing now, getting into the, getting into the land from the web, um, it's getting harder. It's getting harder, but it's still possible. So um, SQL Ninja, the dude Ice Surfer who wrote this tool, um, it's in Perl, but I'm not hating him for that because um, I was a Perl monkey, but I've seen the light that which is Python 3. I am gone, I am gone, I am gone. But his tool works really well. You can upload Netcat, Meterpreter, DNS Tunnel. Um, great, great, great support for that. So I really think that's a good project. And then he just released an upgrade not too long ago. Okay, SQL map, especially since it's in Python, fucking rocks. 
Okay? It allows you to upload um, um, interpreter shell and it has its own S, uh, OS shell that you can fucking drop. It's freaking awesome. So you can just, you know, go right at it and it drops to where it says OS shell and you can just uh, do your operating system commands, you know, IP config, netstat or whatever. Or you can go straight to an interpreter shell. I use this a lot. Still works. Okay? All right. We have to focus on the important stuff. The important stuff is not getting caught, okay? We're officially going to title this section of the talk, Don't Be a Tiger. Okay? The goal when you're doing this is not to get caught. I don't know. Who thinks Tiger's a punk? Tiger's a fucking punk. Like, okay, help me here. If I'm worth a billion dollars and you're a porn star, you fucking know I'm going to have some people kill you if you talk, right? <laughs> I'm just making sure, who's with me? Raise your hand if you would. Yeah. <laughs> she ain't fucking talking. All right, so biggest things that I run into, filter evasion. You have a lot of people who try to do all types of things. So the first thing is client-side filtering. This is bad. This is bad. This is bad. This is bad. Did I say that this is bad? This is bad. Do not use JavaScript or VBScript or anything client-side to try to filter input to your critical application. Or if you're using a framework like J2EE where your frameworks create this JavaScript for you, you're going to have to write server-side code that checks to verify uh, what's coming in from the client. Okay, you just got to freaking deal with it, man. Anything that's happening on the client's machine is his. So I have to do these little lessons for developers. I'm like, okay, developer, I want you to think about this. You're going to put all the security on the hacker's laptop. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Right? So, guys, don't use client side filtering. Do not use client side filtering. Okay? All right. Restrictive blacklist. I oftentimes run into people who now restrict special characters. Well, you can't send an equal sign, can't send a greater than sign, less than sign, or something like that. But um, especially with SQL and syntax, you don't necessarily have to say that one equals one because isn't one kind of like one? Two kind of like two? Rum and Coke, kind of like rum and Coke. Just a thought. So SQL injection actually does work without special characters in a lot of cases. Okay, and then the IDS. Now, how many of you have this as your mouse pad? Come on, I'm with the nerds. I'm with the nerds. I'm with the nerds. So you got to have your ASCII decimal chart, hex chart, uh, break it out as your mouse pad, or what I just learned the other night while unbelievably drunk, Drop to a shell and type man ASCII. That shit fucking worked. I was like, damn. Drop to a shell and type man ASCII and the shit is right there? Fuck, dude, that's cool. So when dealing with the IDS, okay, so we've got alert, TCP, any IP coming from any port, going to our web servers on our web server ports. We're looking for specifically tick or one equals one, okay? How many hackers are we really going to catch with this one? So let's think about it. Um, does two equal two? 40 ounce equal 40 ounce? Huh? Most definitions of? Okay, so a lot of what I'm running into, when you actually take the time to sit down and read a lot of these IDS rules, you're like, good God, man. So yes, this is my opinion of IDS. Okay, and you're starting to see that it really doesn't matter. I mean, you, you know, as people do like this and and or and they're looking for still one equals one or nine equals nine or, you know, anything like that, you're going to find that, man, it's just a, lo it's a losing cause. And thank God SQL map does all this obfuscation that I'm showing you up here by default and it's in Python. <laughs> okay. So the same thing that I'm showing you here where I did my OR1 or excuse me, OR2 and select user, where in this case I put the entire thing in hex. Okay, you can do this in Unicode, you can do it in UTF-7, UTF-8, UTF-16, all these different you know, encodings, it doesn't matter. Base64, it doesn't matter. Okay, this stuff works. It works at getting by a lot of IDSs and laughs. Okay, last thing. Um, the one product in the PHP space that I think is absolutely the shit is PHP IDS. I think it's fucking cool as shit. Now, they've got something on their website. So if you go to demo.phpids.net, 
they've got a smoke test where with the smoke test, you can put in all of your SQL injection, cross-site scripting, or web application attacks, and it shows you what signatures it flags. So you can keep practicing your Kung Fu right here. Like, okay, well, I tried it this way, it got flagged. I tried it this way, the number of signatures it flagged was less. And you just keep working and keep working and keep working until that bad boy finally tells you, it's good. Okay, that's what you got to do. So you just keep working on your Kung Fu and working on your Kung Fu until you find something that's going to bypass most of the rules. Now, Mod Security has teamed up with PHP IDS, and they've got their own smoke test. And again, I was a little hungover, so I didn't add it to my slides. But they've got their own smoke test where it actually loads the Mod Security CRS core rule set and PHP IDS and Snort rules all in one web interface. So you just keep throwing it in there until it bypasses all of those and fucking smooth sailing. All right, so signature IDS, it's a fucking joke. IPS and WAF, it's a fucking joke. And then at least what I'm running into, I don't really have clients who really look at it anyway. So they bought it, but looking at it, that's a different story. Now, for those of you who are IDS analysts and WAF people where you actually man the thing all fucking day, I know I talk a lot of shit, but I feel your pain because I used to do your job and um, there's not enough alcohol in the world for the job that you do. All right, so right now the overwhelming majority of stuff that I'm doing is what I just showed you, getting in through the web. So like I said, you deal with the IDS, you deal with the IPS, and then pretty much it's, it's web shit. Remote file include, uh, war file upload. Who's been giving JBoss the beat down with the war file upload? That shit fucking rocks. So war file uploads with JBoss, uh, SQL injection, just encoding some sort of way so that I can get into it. Uh, that usually gives me a shell either in the LAN or in the DMZ, and I try to work from there. After that, I do the unbelievable thing and send the client email because it fucking works. So I send the client email, you know, client side with Metasploit, it's beautiful. So you just choose whatever the latest uh, browser, PDF, ActiveX, or file format exploit is. Make sure it's um, a reverse TCP shell. And now the Metasploit has reverse HTTPS. Freaking beautiful. The only bad thing about it is it's fucking written in Ruby. Okay, so a Python tool is set. So to me, set is some next level shit. I think, man, Relic is doing some unbelievable shit with set. So guys, uh, for me, round of applause to Relic. This is what we need. This is what we need so that we can illustrate the point of what's going on. The hacker community does not port scan your networks anymore. And if they are port scanning your networks, those are fucking busters anyway. They're probably not going to get a real shell. Okay? Real hackers are you know, pushing everything with you know, these drive-by downloads and you know, freaking email type stuff. This is where it's going. So setting up fake websites, spear phishing, and all that kind of stuff, that's the kind of thing that we've got to get clients to understand needs to happen in your pen test. Okay? If you deal with the same client that I had who just stood up and says, Joe, well, I'm not going to pay you to tell me I need user training. Okay? No, man. No. You, you have to replicate the real threat. This is what hackers are doing. We have to replicate that threat. So client-side pen testing is where it needs to go. Okay. Pivoting into the LAN. Well, since, since the overwhelming majority of my attacks are client-side after my web stuff, pivoting into the LAN is important. So Metasploit supports the pivot. If not, I have a whole cab file upload thing where I upload some cab files that have all of my executables uh, statically compiled so there's no install. And I just use that as my workshop to pivot into the LAN. So jump right into the LAN and start moving around from there. Uh, next thing that I look for is uh, common LAN security solutions. So. Things that I run into, no DHCP, DHCP MAC reservations, port security, and NAC. So, can't get on the network. Okay, now I'm kind of tying this together. So you've pivoted into the LAN via client side or you're on the internal assessment and you have to try and get on the LAN. So, um, my kids taught me these because they're unbelievably ineffective. So, static IP addresses, I hope you don't have a client who actually says they're gonna stop people by using static IPs. So we all know, steal the MAC address, we get on, right? DHCP MAC reservations, we know that we're going to steal a valid MAC and get on the network, right? Port security, you know that we're going to steal a valid MAC and get on the network. Now who does what I do where you walk by and you like lift up the computer and you read the MAC address? You're like, cool. 
and now I'll go get on the network, right? Okay, Mac solutions, the biggest thing that I've been doing is look for 802.1x exceptions, okay? Things that can't support 802.1x, like printers, copiers, CD-ROM.